Amen. So we are in our uh, Armor of God series. Super excited. How many people have enjoyed it so far? I'm telling you, this is a... I really feel like this is the equipping of the saints. This is what we were just talking about. It's more than hype, more than emotion. All that stuff is fun. I love when we have a rowdy crowd and it's exciting, but emotions will wear off, but that word will never fade away. That word will never fade away, but you can still get rowdy. It's all right. Amen. Kind of like I was rowdy whenever the Cowboys were playing last Sunday all the way to the very end. I was like, I deal with a lot of, can I just vent real quick before I get into this? Can I please? I deal with a lot of things that are stressful in my life. And nothing is more stressful than those Dallas Cowboys, man. They be killing me. How do y'all lose that game? Oh. Pray for them. Pray for Dak. Amen. Amen. We're Cowboy fans here, son. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Let's get back. But it is a biblical team. Y'all know that, right? Cowboys. When Jesus comes back, he's going to be riding on a what? On a horse. So he's a cowboy. When they saw the, what did they look up and they saw in the sky? Whenever, they, how did they know that Jesus was born? They went up. There's a cowboy star is what they saw. I understand. It said he's, he's wrapped in blue and silver cloth. Okay, now he did. It's purple. <laughs> I'm just making stuff up now. All right, let's get into this word. We are in the armor of God series. In week one, we covered the belt of truth. And uh, week two, we covered the breastplate of righteousness. That is a good message right there. Um, God was revealing stuff to me on that message. And uh, it's super, super good. You can go back on the app. Check out those. But we're going to pick up on the third piece of the armor. Um, so if you have your Bibles or your phone, go to Ephesians chapter six. And if not, we'll have the uh, passage behind me on the screens. Ephesians six, starting at verse 10. And the word of the Lord reads, Finally, a, a, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. It says to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. If you remember in week one, to be strong in the Lord has more to do with receiving God's strength than displaying your own strength. Come on, how many people know that you cannot give what you don't have? So in order to get this strength from God or in order to have strength, you have to receive the strength of God. Like, we could pray, God, give me strength, or you could pray, God, give me your strength. Come on, how many people know it's always going to be better to have God's strength versus your own? Like, I can only bench press five or 600 pounds on a bad day, right? Right, amen. Amen, Pastor, we could tell. No, I'm just playing that. No, about 405 the most. I still playing it. Still... It doesn't matter how much I can bench. Let's, let's leave that aside. Because at the end of the day, my power has limits. God's power is limitless. We all have strength that we can wake up and, and, and get through the day, but it still ends at the end of the day. But there is a strength that you can tap into, and it is the strength of God. So we start to shift our prayers from God, help me with my strength versus God, give me your strength. And so this is what we're praying. God, give me your strength. Verse 11 says, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm. Everybody say stand firm, stand firm. against all the strategies of the devil. And if you remember to stand firm means to express, look at the enemy opposition and express the fact that you're coming against that enemy. How many people know that you need to know the devil needs to know that you're coming against him? Some people you look and you're like, man, I can't tell what side you're on. You on the devil's side or God's side? Like a boxer, he gets in the ring and he faces the opponent. He squares up with them. He gets in his fighting stance. And so what the Bible is telling us is to put on the armor of God, stand firm, get in your stance and let the enemy know that he is the opposition. Come on, somebody. How many people know that you got to get rid of fear? You got to get rid of doubt. We got to let the devil know that we're not on his team anymore. Come on, how many people are with the kingdom of God now? Amen. Amen. And I, I want to tell you that if you thought your life was hard before, this is spiritual warfare, right? We thought it was hard before. And if you thought it was hard whenever you were on the devil's side, how much harder is it going to be now that you flipped and you're on the kingdom of God? The devil really wants you now. But the Bible says that he did not leave us empty handed. He left us with his Holy Spirit. That is alone is good enough. The Bible said that the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives inside of us. 
So we have the power of the spirit, dunamis power, the power, explosive power that can bring down strongholds. And it's not just a, a, a power that's on the inside of us. The apostle Paul says that God has equipped us with weapons, put on all of uh, God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. We learned that the, the main strategy of the devil is division. It's to divide people against one another. Why? Because I believe the devil knows. Come on, how many people know that, that, that there's, there's power in unity? You remember when the apostle Peter, he was locked up in prison and the saints of God, the church started praying and what happened? Peter got set free. Whenever the apostle Paul, he was locked up in prison with Silas, the Bible said that they started praising and singing hymns to God and the whole prison started listening. Then out of nowhere, at midnight, the Holy Spirit shook that whole place. The foundation shook the, shook the foundation. The doors were opened up and the shackles were released and everybody was set free right at that moment. How many people know that there is power in unity when we come together? The, the, God is everywhere. He was in this building before we showed up. But the fact that we showed up glorifying that God means he's really going to show up. He starts to manifest himself and the devil knows that. That's why he wants your household divided. That's why he wants the church, uh, church, the, 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 the church house divided. He knows whenever he can get us to turn on each other, then we start to lose that power that the Bible says where two or three are gathered, God is surely in the midst. And he, he understands that. So if he can get us to, to start bickering and fighting with each other, then he starts to get the upper hand. And if it worked 2,000 years ago, do you think that he's still going to be trying to do the same thing? Right? We better believe that he's going to try the same thing. And the apostle Paul is giving us, I was going to say free game, but as y'all understand that, <laughs> giving us understanding and revelation through theology. I'm just like, free game. He's telling us right now that this is what the devil's going to do to destroy your household and the house of God. So pay attention. Verse 12, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. In other words, as long as you think that somebody else is the enemy, you're never going to see the real enemy. And as long as you take up energy fighting the battles that don't matter, you will not have the energy to win the battles that do matter. You exhaust yourself fighting a battle that doesn't win. You're on Facebook, you're on YouTube comments, you're over here, you're, all, you're battling, and you're fighting all these battles that it doesn't matter. Even if you win the battle, the, the moment that you win the battle, you get the W, you get the L. Because you lose the battle no matter what. You prove your point here on earth to somebody that you don't even know. Don't even go to Rise. Don't even live in Abilene. Not even a believer. And we're bickering back and forth with those people. The moment that you win that battle, you lost. Because you took time and energy to fight a battle that does not even matter. And then you don't have the energy to fight and win the battles that really do matter. When Satan is coming against your child, when Satan is coming against your marriage, when he's coming against your mind, we need to be equipped, sober, and alert, ready to fight a real enemy. So we, we toss all that aside and realize that the real enemy is an enemy that we don't see. But with the Holy Spirit's power, we do see because we could detect his strategies. Verse 13, therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in a time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. When the dust settles and the smoke clears, you'll still be standing firm. You might have some dents in your armor, your helmet sideways and... <laughs> You got a little bitty pocket knife and that's it, but I'm still standing. Come on, so everybody say, I'm still standing. I'm still standing. You got to get that on the inside of you. After you've done everything to stand, keep standing. And whenever that time of, of opposition is over, you will still be standing firm. Then it says, stand your ground. Remember, stand your ground means to not give up your ground. Right? There's a, there's a, there's a, a law in the state of Texas called stand your ground. Somebody tries to break in your house, you don't have to run out the back door. You can stand your ground. In other words, you don't have to give up your household. So when the enemy is coming into your household, you can stand your ground and say, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Say, you can get going. You can't have my kids. You can't have my marriage. You can't have my life. You can't have that. I'm going to stand my ground, stand firm against Satan and all the strategies that he comes against me with. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness for shoes. Put on the peace that comes from the good news. Say, put on peace. It says we put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared today. The third piece of the armor or shoes of peace. Now, my uh, wife, my beautiful wife and my beautiful daughter brought it to my attention that I wear my shoes all day long at the house. And um, 
And it's, you may wonder, like, all right, not that big of a deal, but it's because my wife says I can't never sit still for too long, and I'm always making a reason to leave because I have Ray DD, is what she calls it. I'm like, I'm going to go get gas. Y'all need anything from the store? I'm going to go get some groceries. I'm going to go wash a car. And I get, I don't know, y'all have any extroverted people like that? Y'all don't like you get cabin fever after five and a half minutes. I'm ready to go somewhere. I'm ready to get out of the house. All my introverts, y'all like, just go, right? Leave me alone. That's my wife. My wife can chill for a whole minute. And I, Hello, beautiful wife. Here she's walking in. Huh? I wasn't talking about you. Is she looking at me still? No, I just want <laughs> So she, they're the ones who brought it to my attention that I never take off my shoes. And um, because I'm always going, she's like, you got Ray DD. And then uh, the other day I left and I came back in the house and I was like, you know what? I said, I'm going to chill for the rest of the day. And she was like, oh, okay. Yeah, right. And then my daughter, she saw me, and she was like, oh, no, he's being for real. He took off his shoes. <laughs> I'm like, is it that bad? They're like, oh, my wife was like, yeah, if he takes off his shoes, he's chilling. Like, he's, he's done for the day. I retire for the evening. And my, wife, uh, my, my daughter, she was like, dad, she was like, why do you always have your shoes on, <laughs> even at the house? And I said, baby, if you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. <laughs> I'm like, you don't know. Some might pop off. You never know. God be ready to go. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. And this is exactly what the Apostle Paul is saying. Even though that was funny what I was saying, he's being the same exact way. When it comes to the shoes of peace, Always have them on because if you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready because there's going to come a time when Satan is coming against you and your family. Make sure you have the armor ready. Make sure you have your shoes on because it says that you will be fully prepared. It is the gospel. Put that last verse up there. One more time. Verse 15. It says, it says right here, put on the, the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. The good news is what? The gospel. So for shoes, you put on the gospel, and that's what makes you prepared. Come on, how many people know that we need to have preparation in the gospel? The gospel is what prepares us, knowing the good news, knowing what Jesus did for us. That is the good news. That is what prepares us. So the Apostle Paul is saying that there is a spiritual battle. Come on, how many people know that we're at war? Right? If you didn't know that, now you know that. Welcome to Christianity. You're either coming out of a war, in a war, or headed, in, or headed into a war. Either way, your forecast is full. There's a storm coming. Somebody said, when is the war over? It's not going to be, right? When is this battle going to end? Just get used to it, right? It's, it's, we get stronger. It doesn't get easier. We just get better. And what used to bog us down, now we can get through like nothing. God strengthens us, and, and there is that resistance. Remember, they call it resistance training in, in the gym, right? And that's whenever we go through storms and we go through battles, it says to resist that opposition. And after you've resisted opposition for long enough, you end up getting muscles that you never had and you would have never had if you didn't go through what you went through. So God allows those storms so you can come out better on the other side. If you knew what you were going to be like on the other side of that attack, you would start praising God in the middle of that storm because you're going to be better for your family, better for your kids, better for yourself, better for your mental health, knowing, like, like some people would say, God, help me with my mental health. Help me with my physical health. And, and if you knew how that was going to come, what you would say is, God, bring me through a storm that's going to require me to have so much faith in you. Whenever I am done, my mind is going to be steadfast on you. My body's going to be ready for you. Well, we don't pray that prayer, though, right? <laughs> Nobody says, God, take me through the fire and purify me. God, turn up the furnace, God. Purify me like gold. But nobody says that, but what we do say is, God, sharpen me, make me better, God. And he's over here throwing coals in the fire, right? He's like, you asked for it. It's because that's the way that God works. We pray for something, then God puts us through a season where we have to fully depend on him. That's why I say be careful when you pray for patience, right? Because then you're in a season where you need patience. When you say, God, I, I want to see a miracle, you be careful because you're going to end up in a situation where you need a miracle to get out of it. But you saw a miracle, amen? What I started praying is, God, give me grace. <laughs> Just give me grace and mercy, God, however that looks, because I'm tired of all this patient stuff and all everything else that comes with it. So there is a battle that we go through. There is a warfare that, there's warfare that we are in, and it's up to us. The quicker that we start to learn the weapons that we have, the armor that we have, the better you're going to be able to fight. Because listen, you're in this no matter what. Once you've crossed over, 
from death to life, you've crossed over into Christianity, the war has already begun. And that it's up to you how you're going to fight for the rest of your life. If you're going to tap out and give up or are you going to fight, press in, lean into this and give the devil a challenge. So there's a different type of peace. Today we're going to cover the shoes of peace, right? There's a, a couple types of peace that I, I felt like I needed to cover before I go into the armor of peace. You know, last week, uh, how many of y'all were here, were here last week? Right, we talk about the breastplate of righteousness. Come on, how many people have a brand new understanding of righteousness, right? You're being in the right side, right, uh, uh, right with God, the, what is, which is righteousness. And there's two different types of righteousness, imputed righteousness and part of righteousness, big theological terms. Uh, you can go last week and watch it online. But in other words, there's a couple different types of righteousness. Well, there's a, different, a couple different types of peace as well. Uh, this is what I want to say. There's a lot of people that come into this world, and you may relate to this, before you got saved, you felt that if you were to just play it neutral and not take a side, I'm not for God, but I'm not against God, that somehow you're not going to take the judgment like everybody else. Have you ever thought that before? Right before Christianity? I don't want to admit it. Y'all know y'all did. It's like, I felt like I could be neutral. I'm not this outspoken atheist, right? I'm not coming against, I just don't believe. And because I'm not against God, I'm not for God, that somehow that I'm not going to get judgment. Like I get out, of, uh, get out of jail or a get out of hell free card, right? But the Bible does not say that uh, because the Bible says before we were made righteous, we were what? Sinners, right? That means that we were sinful by nature. We were born sinners. And this is what Romans 8, 7 says. And the word of the Lord reads, it says the sinful mind is at war with God. There's two states that a nation could be in. You're either in a time of war or a time of peace. So by default, when you're on this side, if this is the, the dividing line, this is a place of war, and that side is a place of peace. How many people want to be made right with God and be a place of peace, amen? So it's by default. You are at war with God. So you can't play, you can't play the background. Like, well, I'm not going to believe in God. I just don't, I'm not an unbeliever or I'm not an outspoken unbeliever. I just don't believe in him. There is no neutral ground. Every single person, whenever you are, are born in this world, you are at war with God. We read in the fifth chapter of Romans that we were enemies of God. We were enemies of God before we were reconciled and made righteous, but praise be to God, Jesus Christ made a way for us on that cross so we no longer have to be enemies of God and at war with God, but we can have peace with God. Can we make some noise and get excited for what Jesus did on that cross of Calvary? That's something to be excited about. I'm telling you, Essex, Romans, because Romans 5.1 says this, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, Come on, made right in his sight, made right, made righteous. I'm in right standing, right? So now the, the fact that we have been made righteous because of God, by faith, we have peace with God. Everybody say, I have peace with God. This is what we want. We are no longer at war. We have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. That is something to get excited about. I want to tell you, listen, real quick, I, I want to tell you this. What Jesus did on that cross should never become normal to you. It should never become a just natural. That's a supernatural thing. Because the moment we start to forget what Jesus did for us, we, we, start, to, we, we start to forget the kind of life that we should be living. I, I say this, don't get so saved that you forget what God saved you from. Don't get so saved, like I'm so Christian now that just a couple years ago you weren't so Christian. Right. Like, don't don't act like you got everything all figured out and like you don't have a past and you don't have a testimony. And Jesus Christ is the one who set you free from it all. You can never get too used to what God did for you. Just before in the, in the first service, I got I got before the Lord and I went into my green room and I was about to preach a message. And I was like, God, I don't want to get up there and just think that you're going to show up no matter what. And that I got this word. God, I want there to be brokenness before you. God, I want to trust in you. And I took communion. And I, and I got the, the little piece of bread, and I said, God, I never want to get used to what you did for me. I want it to blow my mind every day. I, I took that little piece of bread, and I cracked it in half. I broke the bread. And when you take communion, that's representative of what Jesus Christ did for us. His body was bruised and broken. He was crushed. He was pierced for us. Come on, how many people know that you, you got to be grateful for what Jesus did for you? 
You got to be grateful that Jesus t- took that penalty for you. I took it. I broke that bread. I got on my knees and I, I drank the cup and I said, God, thank you for your blood because it was by your blood that I was set free. It was by your blood that I was made righteous before I go up there and preach. I want to remember why I'm even doing this. This is the peace with God. So the first type of peace that we're going to experience with our salvation is peace with God. Check this out. This is the ability or or the ability to have peace with God is the good news of the gospel. Come on. How many people know that's good news? The fact that you can have peace with God and you don't have to be at war with him any longer. But how many people can say that before you got saved, you were at war all day long? Mentally, spiritually, physically, you were at war all day long. Now, I don't know about you, but when I got saved, I felt like there was this burden that was lifted off of me. How many people can say that? Like there was a real burden that was lifted off of me and I felt for the first time I was no longer at war. Now, there's still battles that we go through, but how many people would say that the reason why you dabbled in so much stuff is because you didn't have peace, right? The reason why we were hunting down everything, trying to find some type of fulfillment is really what we were wanting was the peace of God in our lives. So we did all kinds of different things to try to get that fulfillment, and for a little bit, it works. But how many people know that it still runs empty? But the peace of God will never run dry. The peace of God is endless. Whenever you have God in your life, that is the change that you were looking for your whole life. And then when you get saved, you're like, man, I wasted all that money (laughs) on a peace (laughs) that wasn't real peace, on a 20 piece. Y'all know it's true. Y'all don't act all holy in the second service. Y'all are. But really what you were trying to chase down is real peace your whole life. And what you were doing was escaping from the battle that you were facing but didn't know how. So you try to sedate yourself or drink yourself or date yourself or try to get out of that scenario that you were in. And for a temporary moment, temporary moment, or maybe three days, right? until you saw the unseen world come alive, right? You're like, it's time to go to sleep. (laughs) And it all wears off. And you're faced with the person that you know is the problem. And you don't know how to change it. And whenever you leave that, you have an alternate state of reality, you bring a substance into your life, you can become something that you are not for the moment. But the second you sober up, You are back to the person that you really are. And you're not happy with the person that you really are. So you're forced to escape all over again until you can find out who you really were, become God made, the person that God really made you to be. You can be happy with who you are because it's who he made you to be. And it doesn't really matter what anybody else has to say about it. And that is peace with God that nobody can give you. No, no, nothing can give you that peace. There is nobody who can give you that peace. So the first type of peace that we experience is peace with God. The second type of peace is a peace that we get from God. Remember how we get strength from God? We have our strength, but we want God's strength, right? There's peace that we can kind of get on our own, but what you really want is God's peace. Come on, how many people want God's peace today? We want... Peace from God, which is a fruit of the Spirit, right? Because now that you're at peace with God, you have his Spirit, and now you develop a relationship and you get fruit of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, and 23 says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace. Everybody say, I want peace. No, no, say, I got peace. Or is it, I have peace? Which, do we have a teacher? Is it, is it, I got or I have? Either one. Let's say it wrong. We're at ride. I got peace. I just want to It makes it feel better. We're not looking for it. (laughs) Searching the carpet for it, right? (laughs) We're definitely not putting this one online. You can kill the camera if you want. (laughs) You're like, there it is. (laughs) Some people are like, why would peace be in the carpet? (laughs) <laughs> Thank God if you don't know. <laughs> a 
Love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So this is a peace that you have already. And this is what I want to tell you. All my, all my new Christians, this is what I really want. And I've been saved 100 years. It doesn't matter. Uh, this type of peace is not a feeling. It's a fruit. That means it is developed through a relationship with God. You don't conjure it up on your own. This type of peace, you don't, you don't just make it happen on your own. Like happiness is a feeling. Joy is a fruit. Happiness comes and goes. If, you're, if your joy and your peace is determined on a circumstance, that means that you're going to be double-minded up and down all day long. What you have to understand is the peace that I got comes from within, not a circumstance from with around me, not an external circumstance. Or, this is something that I have on the inside of me. You have to understand that if not, you're going to be chasing goosebumps for the rest of your life. In order to feel God, you have to have this certain type of goosebump. No, this is, it comes from God and God alone. That's what I want to tell you. This type of peace, for all my people who are on a journey for mental health and, and, and figuring that stuff out because I'm right there with you, this is what I want to tell you. This type of peace cannot be experienced through mindfulness techniques, meditation, or positive thinking. Those are all great things if they're centered around the Bible. Those things may help calm and stabilize your emotions, but cannot and will not bring the peace that can only come from God. You can journal, you can have a counselor, a therapist, I do all of that stuff. But there is no thing, no one, there is nothing that can bring the peace of the Holy Spirit in your life. That is God alone. That is the peace that surpasses, transcends all understanding and that will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. I've, I've done funerals, I've, been, I've done hospital visits, hospice visits, I've done them, I've done them all. And there is a significant difference in the ones who know they are going to heaven and those who have no clue if it's real or not. I, I, there is this sense, I've, I've, been at, at, I've done funerals where they know the person's going to heaven. Now, you still deal with the emotions. You still deal with the sadness. But there is this different hope that you have. You have this hope that I know when it's all said and done, I'm going to see my mom, my dad, my family member, or my friend. Because I have this hope that is in Christ. I've done, I've done hospice visits. I've, done, I've, I've went to uh, on both sides. You know, you, you think that you don't believe in God and you really don't care about God. But you know what? Laying on a deathbed will really start making you reevaluate everything. You're like, I better get this thing right. <laughs> I, I would rather believe and not have been right than didn't believe and was wrong. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'd rather get, get it right. I would rather believe there was a God and have been wrong. And this God and this book changed my whole life. Get me off of drugs, get me off of alcohol, change my family, raise my life, have a, a really good life and it all be fake. Then to not have believed any of it and it was all real. I praise God. I, I, real quick, because I'm running out of time. Thank you, Jesus. We can go ahead and get somebody up here. Play, please. I realize I have five minutes left. Uh, I've done hospice visits on both sides. I had a lady who was late 80s, stage four cancer, getting ready to die. And they tell me, can you go up and pray for her because she's about to die? And I walk in and she's just full of life, watching a sermon on her iPad that I preached, walking in. And she's like, who cares what those doctors are saying? I'm fine. I, like they saw all these tumors and all kinds of stuff. There's confirmation. They have all this. And she's like, who cares what they have to say? I'm fine. Eyes lit up. Perfectly fine. I pray for her. I'm like, are you even sick? Because you don't look sick. I'm going to be honest with you. Pray for her. And a couple days she walks out of there. Five, six months later. And then there she's back in it. They're like, oh, it got worse this time. I go over there and I'm like, it's the same thing. She's like, Whatever. They can say whatever they want. Her, leg, her legs were deteriorating. They were so weak that her thigh snapped with just her standing up. And they had to put her back in a healthcare um, facility all the way to the end. And I was like, man, there is something different about you. I don't get it. I, I don't get like how you can have so much peace in your life. But then I do get it. And I believe when you have that type of peace in your life, it starts to affect your mind. And when your mind is right, 
It's like your body takes over. Everything starts to go right. And it doesn't matter. She's like, it doesn't matter if I die or not. I know where I'm going to go. I have peace with my Savior. I know where I'm going to end up. And I said, I pray that I live a long, healthy life. But when it's my time to go, I pray to God I go like you. Because that is an example of what all believers should be. Whenever you have peace, it's, it's this peace with God, but I have this peace from God, this peace within, and no medical condition, no doctor, nobody could take that peace away from you because they did not give you that peace. God is the one who gave you that peace. Now, peace isn't just something we have with God and get from God, I'm here to tell you now we can talk about the armor of God, right? Peace is a weapon of war. Peace is a weapon of war. You may not think of shoes much as a weapon, right? Uh, unless you've been kicked before, right? <laughs> then you're like, no, that's a weapon. Mass destruction. <laughs> but shoes are a weapon. But check this out. Man, this is mind blowing here. Romans 16:20 says this, the God of peace, think about the dichotomy, the, the, look at the, uh, the contrast here, how it doesn't make sense, but it does make sense. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Think about it. That doesn't even make sense. The God of peace, he's just full of peace. Now, the God of peace is going to crush Satan. That's what's going to happen. And guess who, who he's going to use? You. He's going to use your feet. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. But you have to understand, we have to do it his way. You have to do it his way. Because if you go trying to do it on your own, you're going to mess some stuff up. And you're going to crush some things and have to pull out another piece and whatever is <laughs> that's not the piece that you want right it's here it says the god of peace will soon crush satan under your feet whose feet what do you wear on your feet what kind of shoes shoes of peace you got to put on the shoes of peace and that means when you're walking in the shoes of peace god will crush satan's head with your feet when you learn to walk in the shoes of peace. They're a weapon of war. It's a weapon of war. But remember, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 says, the weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So remember, the, the, the kingdom of God is upside down and backwards. The way that we fight is not how we used to fight any longer. We give peace. So when the devil hits and tries to get a reaction, instead we give him peace. You give them peace. And when you give the devil peace, when you, when they give back peace, when you give that response peace, when the world wants a reaction and you respond with peace, what you do is allow God to crush Satan's head every single time because you don't get involved. If you want to avenge yourself, don't expect God to do it. If you try to defend yourself, don't expect God to do it. God is the avenger. God gets revenge. God is the one who opposes the enemy. All we have to do is put on the shoes of peace and walk in it. Another tactic of the enemy is to get us to develop a stronghold of bitterness against people, but eventually against God. The real strategy of the enemy is to get you so turned on each other, to get you to turn your back on church. You walk away, but really what you're doing is turning your back on God and walking away from God. There is this root of bitterness. And if you don't address this root of bitterness, it is going to chase you down for the rest of your life. And you would pass away this way with bitterness. I have a video real quick about bitterness, and then we're going to continue on in this message. On the morning of April 19th, 1995, Timothy McVeigh took a rented rider truck, drove it to the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. Inside that truck was a bomb he was about to commit mass murder. He locked the door, walked away, lit the fuse, and at 9.02, the bomb exploded. It leveled about a third of the building, floors pancaked, 300 buildings in the surrounding area were destroyed or torched, cars were aflame, but the physical toll was not nearly as devastating as the human toll. 168 people lost their lives that day, 19 of them were children. One of those was a father of a 14-year-old boy who over 20 years later sat through a Life Action Summit and wrote this testimony. 
I didn't realize until this week, I've been mad at God for over 20 years. Since April 19th, 1995, I've been mad and not trusted him. That was the day my father was killed in the Oklahoma City bombing. I was 14, I lost the man who was my idol and a godly presence in my life. I've always been happy on the outside, but empty on the inside, trying to be like the world to be happy. The Sermon on Forgiveness changed my heart. I realized there was no person I was harboring grudge against. It was God himself. I've let that go, and I'm working on becoming closer to him. Thank you, Life Action. God bless, and please continue to pray for me. Amen. Can we thank God for peace and forgiveness? Amen. The, the shoes of peace had multiple layers of leather, and in that leather, they would put spikes going down, kind of like athletes wear cleats, right? And whenever you put on those shoes, whenever you're walking, it would help stabilize you. You could stand firm. And it wasn't just so you could advance and push forward. It's so the enemy, when he pushed you, you didn't backslide. You didn't slide backwards. What I believe what happens is one of the tactics of the devil is to get you so hurt and so upset and so mad at other people that you become bitter. And when you become bitter, you backslide. Because really what you're upset, you're not really upset just at that person, what that man said. What he was really upset, he was upset at God. And so that bitterness destroys, but peace restores. It is, when you put the shoes on, it has the cleats. And so the enemy hits you with something to make you mad. The enemy hits you with something that you would have, have whatever in your heart towards bitterness towards somebody, but it keeps you from pushing backwards. It keeps you secure where you are. So whenever we put on the shoes of peace, it allows us to go through situations. Instead of harboring bad feelings in our heart, it allows us to stay firm and continue to walk forward with God because the biggest tactic of the enemy gets us to divide on each other, but really it's to get you to turn your back on God. This is why I want to tell you these shoes are a weapon of war. When the enemy strikes, you strike back with peace. When the enemy hits, you strap up your shoes and you have the shoes of peace. No matter how many upset you get, no matter what you're going through, you choose peace. Come on. How many people know that you can choose peace in the middle of every circle? circumstance and, the, and, and through every season of your life. I want to tell you this morning, I got a text message from Pastor Billy and Pastor Jojo. We're in this thread and he said this, that sometimes we can get so caught up and we're moving so fast and we're thinking of so future that we forget of what God is doing right now in our lives. He said this, if God didn't do another thing for you for the rest of your life, he's already done enough for you to wake up every morning and give him praise. He's already done enough. He's already done enough. The fact that you have breath in your lungs right now, God has already done enough. So what do we do about it? Now that we have peace, we need to share that peace. Now that we have the peace of God, we need to go share that peace, the, the, the peace of God with other people. Romans 10, 14 and 15 says, how then will they call on him who they have not believed and how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. The apostle Paul is saying a silent Christian is an, an effective Christian. Not everybody has to preach with the microphone in their hand, but everybody needs to preach the gospel. You preach the gospel with your lifestyle. You preach the gospel with, by the way that you are. And don't ever think because your lifestyle isn't so perfect that you can't preach the gospel. Because sometimes it, I would rather have a person who is imperfect tell me about a perfect God than somebody who appears perfect on the outside telling me about a perfect God. I'll never be able to come that person. But what really, whenever you still have work to do, and you preach the gospel to somebody else, you know what that tells them? That I can still have work to do and still believe in the same God that you believe in. There was a, a, a story real quick in 1732. These two guys, they experienced a call to preach the gospel to African slaves in the West Indies who at the time had no access to the gospel. Uh, when they were told that they weren't allowed to go to these islands to preach, they decided to sell themselves into slavery. 
because they couldn't get there. They wanted to go preach to these slaves. They couldn't get there. So they're like, you know what? We're going to sell ourselves into slavery. They became slaves in order to reach slaves. And after they left on their ship, they were never heard of again from again. However, it is recorded as their ship was leaving, they called out to their loved ones, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. When somebody was so committed to bring the gospel to some people who could not get the gospel, there were slaves that we got to get there, though. So they sold themselves into slavery to go reach those slaves and were never heard of again. And we struggle telling our neighbor. We talk about winning the world, but we haven't won our neighborhood. We're going to win the world, but we haven't had the boldness to tell somebody right across the street about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, our youth, they've, always, they've been on this mission where they have to pick somebody and, and, and message them and, and tell them, God loves you, God sees you. God sees you, God loves you. And my son, he was pacing back and forth, and he was like, Ma. He was like, man, Dad, he was like, there's this, there's this person at school that I prayed about it, and God's like, showed me this person. It's just that nobody likes this person. And uh, I think that's why God is telling me to, 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 to message this person. God sees you. God loves you. But I'm kind of hesitant. And I was like, well, he prayed about it. He came back and he saw this video. And this man was saying, I would rather be known as a radical by somebody because my, my son didn't want to be, oh, you're the preacher's kid coming to tell me about Jesus, huh? Like, you're just pushing your faith on people. And the guy in the video said, I would rather have been thought of as a radical who radically try to save people and share the gospel with people than Jesus say, why didn't you tell that person about the gospel and they burn in hell? At some point, you got to think of it like that. Like, I am more concerned about what they might think about me than their soul burning in hell. And I know that's heavy. I know that's a lot of weight. But at some point, you got to look at it like my nervousness and my anxiety versus their eternal salvation. Which one weighs more? But what if I don't say it right? What if I don't? The Holy Spirit is the one doing the work anyways. So the question is, 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 is who needs to hear the gospel in your life? And I pray that God would share it with somebody. And I pray he messes with you until you do it. I pray he convicts you with it and you, you can't. Until you're like, Jesus loves you, and take off running. <laughs> Whatever it takes. Because how many people know that they're, they're, they're worth it, amen? No matter what they're going through, they're worth it. And you have a peace that saved you, saved your marriage, saved your life, saved your suicidal thoughts, drug addiction. God saved you from all that. Now it's time to get that message to somebody else. Can we go share the gospel with somebody else? Listen, there's going to be a time where we don't have to have the armor, but that time isn't right now. If you remember whenever Moses, he was before God, and he says, take off your shoes for this is holy ground. There will be a time where we take off our shoes and we are in the presence of God forever. But that time isn't right now. We are in the presence of God. We want the presence of God, but we have to have the armor of God strapped up, our shoes strapped up, ready, because we're at war and there's a bunch of lost people that the devil is trying to take out forever. So it's up to us to get that peace on the inside of us and take that peace to a lost world. Come on. How many people want to win souls? How many people want to take that peace that you have and take it to a lost world? Father, we thank you, God. Father, we glorify you. We pray for a supernatural anointing and boldness to share the gospel, the good news, that peace with the hurting, dying world. They need you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching, and we hope you received a life-changing word from God today. Make sure you stay up to date on any new content by subscribing to this channel. Outreach, discipleship, and leadership is our mission here at Rise, and we want you to be a part of it. So click the link in the description below to get connected with us. Also in the link, you'll be able to give your tithe and offering, which is being used to grow this ministry that God is using to build this kingdom. God has used our sacrificial giving to completely transform broken people into mighty men and women of God. The Lord is raising the next generation of leaders today. So we thank you so much for your generosity and we will see you next week.